First of all, I would like to thank the organizer to give me this opportunity to come and share the, the experience and the situation in Afghanistan to you. And thanks for your interest to the issue. <clears throat> As uh, our friend already said, I born in Afghanistan, uh, and I am I live in Afghanistan. Uh, I born in a small town or a small village, which is usually hundred percent the minority group uh, Hazaras, and it's she. Uh, we are Shia as also um, in terms of uh, Muslim, of course, but we are. Uh, she is. Uh, I have, actually my father had two wives and my father was working in another province and he took half of our children, his children or my second mother with him but I was in the, the village with my mother. My father was coming once or twice a year. I don't remember everything because uh, it was long ago. Uh, but then it was a time that my father came and I was already, my mother was sending me to the local religious mullah to learn, to study uh, alphabet and, and uh, Quran and so on. So when my father came, he saw that I was able to read and write and do the simple mathematic thing. He decided to take us to him, with him, to the city where he was working. It is another province in Helmand, which is completely uh, dominated Pashtun um, province. Uh, as soon as we arrived, the, 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 the uniform of the school was uh, black clothes. It's still black, but then we had to wear s skirt and socks and a white scarf. So my father brought the black, uh, the black fabric and ask my elder sister to, to make me dress because he wanted me to take me to the school. So he took me next morning to the school. Imagine that I was completely uh, foreign to the area and I didn't know the language. I, don't under, I didn't understand the language because I was only saw the Hazaras on my life. So I was not used to it. And then there's a small difference between the religious uh, uh, that we believe or we, uh, principles of religious. So my father took me to the school and then um, he went to the uh, headmaster. It was a very kind young, uh, young woman who was the headmaster. The, the husband was the governor of the province and then the wife was the headmaster. He took me to, um, to the headmaster and said that she is able to read and write. So if you just take an exam and put her in the second grade. So the, the headmaster said, yes, why not? I mean, we can do that. Why don't you bring her tomorrow? So my father take me again. I mean, I was not really interested. I cried and I tried to convince my father because it was really foreign. I mean, I was kind of, I didn't understand the language, I didn't understand. I haven't seen the people before. So my father took me next morning, he, then the headmaster took me to the, uh, the class teacher. Again, it was a woman and um, then she began to ask me question. So she asked about the, the Persian I was able to read and he, she asked the math I was able to do. But then she began to ask about the religion. And I said what I knew because I, I have not heard the other uh, way of, of uh, the religion that they are saying, or the Sunni kind of a principle of religion. So suddenly this teacher becomes so angry and uh, she shouted at me that her father is coming every day and then uh, look at the, the daughter. So I was, I was shocked and I was crying because at first I didn't understand everything. Secondly, I, I was surprised that what is my mistake? So I learned this. Anyway, she took me to the headmaster. It was this time of the year. It was already a stove in the school. Sorry, I have cold. I was just telling Christian, I said, maybe I'm allergic to the freedom I, I have here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not able to walk in my own country, so I walked here. So that's why maybe I got allergy. Anyway, so 
she took me to the, the headmaster in the class, in the, in the office. And then I was crying. I was crying and of course I was not understanding all the, all the uh, communication between the, them, them. But I did understand that yes, her father is insisting that she is stupid. Okay. Then the headmaster said, uh, ask the teacher to go back to the classroom because the, the children will be um, out or, uh, or doing some noises. But he, she said she will take the exam from me. So she asked me to sit beside the stove and then I think she gave me some sweet. So I was quite young, of course. And um, then when I was quiet, because I was crying, and then she said, uh, now I will, I'm going to ask you the question. So she asked a few things, which is common between the she and Zuni. And as soon as she reached to that part that I knew them my own way, and I stopped. And she actually hugged me and kissed my face and then said, say whatever you want. So I said, okay, this. And she said, my daughter, say what you know at home, but in school you should say this. So, and then she asked me to, to say it, and I repeated, and she said, okay, now you go. And me, I don't know the classroom anymore, because I was really shocked. I mean, I was in, in a fair. So I sat on the, on the cement, because I waited for my brothers. I, I didn't know how to go home, because I didn't know my way. My father brought me with a bicycle, so. I sat there and I was crying, crying. Then my brothers, who was, uh, who were elder, and it was already a co-education school. So then I went with them. So I, on the way, I was preparing what to say, how to convince my father not to send me to school. So as soon as we, the, we entered the house, I, I cried loudly. I said, "I'm not going to school. You can kill me, but I'm not going to school anymore." The reason I'm saying that. We were really facing discrimination because we were thinking differently. We were Muslim, but we were thinking and talking differently. Anyway, so that was the, the time. And then I, after I, um, of course, I become familiar and I tried to be good in the school because the way I was resisting to the teacher discrimination and also to, the, to some of our classmates and so on, so I was trying to be good in the class in order to be the champion. I, I think it's a selfish, but yes, I, I did. Um, then it was a time that I really tried to be good to, uh, to convince my father to let me continue the school. So that was the, uh, the interesting experience. Facing that kind of uh, discrimination, I was always resisting. So when I was in sixth grade, seventh grade, I already began to be trying to look to find what to do to be equal, what to do to stop this discrimination, and so on. So I, I joined some, some lift ideas and political parties. So we were just demonstrating and shouting and did to the king, and, and something like that. Um, <clears throat> then when I was uh, graduating, of course I was uh, first in the class and I was quite, uh, I would say, naughty. So because I was leading the classroom to, to some demonstration against the teacher, resisting against the teacher, and so on. But uh, <coughs> then uh, when I was graduating from 12, my elder brothers, one was already uh, in a military school. He already got a scholarship and he was in Russia. And then my second brother, who was older than me, he was already in, in Kabul University. He was studying engineering and it was my turn. Then my father said that, uh, sorry, you cannot go because we don't have any Hazara girls yet in Kabul University or I, can't, I cannot let you go to the dormitory. We, ha we didn't have a proper dormitory for the girls, but it was a rented house, maybe very few girls from different parts of the country over there. And it was time that I was crying to let me go and continue the education. So the changes in the life that uh, you don't understand when you're young and you're trying to save yourself and try to avoid the discrimination. But then when you're older, then you decide to do differently. Anyway, 
Um, then I had to marry in order to go to university. It was uh, one of the arrangement. Of course, my, my husband was teaching in the university and he promised actually that he will do everything uh, to facilitate to get education. And the reason I'm saying this because I was because I was facing this discrimination as a, as a girl child and I was facing discrimination because of my language, because of my ethnicity, then I was thinking that I should be a road construction engineer because I thought that this yellow helmet will be something very big to, to stand and it's exceptional. So the day when we are going to the, um, to the exam room, my brother, who was in engineering, he was uh, he came with me because we passed the exam in another province, so I was not able to go on my own. Uh, well, it's, uh, of course, the culture and the security, and I was I didn't knew also the the city. So then my brother, while I was entering to the uh, to the classroom, he said, "Think about uh, you're insisting that you want to be the road construction engineering." but I think it might be tough for women. So why don't you think, just write medicine first and then if you, if you did not, do not want to continue, you can always transfer yourself to engineering. So I listened to the, to the brother. So I wrote medicine first and then engineering and so on, but luckily I got a good number, so I was in medicine. So now I, I thought that okay, I got this number. If I don't re, if uh, if I don't go and study medicine, then they would say, okay, she couldn't do it. So the the reason to, again, to resist, just to to show that you are able to do it. Then I went to, to the uh, uh, study medicine. Then because I had a good mark, I, there was one scholarship in Australia which. My father didn't allow me to go, but then I, and the second one, they gave me a scholarship to Hungary because we were, we had a close tie somehow to the Russian and USSR <laughs> friends. Uh, <clears throat> then I, I thought that I will go okay, but it was mechanical engineer, engineering. So I was, while I was studying medicine, I tried to, to complete the, the process for the scholarship. When it was done, then I said, well, I'm not going to, to Hungary because it's difficult to, to go under the car every day. So that I, I don't like. <laughs> Maybe the street construction or road construction engineering is different than to go and repair the car every day. So I went to the, the, the person who was uh, in charge of the, the scholarship. I said, um, well, I, I'm not going. It, everything was ready, my passport was ready, the health checkup, and everything was ready. And he turned his face, he said, we Pashtun, we are always doing this, why are you not going? And I said, well, I'm sorry, I'm not Pashtun. And he said, but I saw you in Kandahar. Accidentally, he was the responsible person in our classroom when we were passing the exam for the university. And I said, yes, you saw me in Kandahar, and I saw you in Kandahar, but it uh, doesn't mean that I'm Pashtun. So the, the overall uh, attitude. Anyway, I continued. My medicine, unfortunately, it, we were at third year of our uh, studying when the coup d'etat happened. The coup d'etat was done by uh, a group of Afghan who were uh, very close to USSR in their mentality, the way they wanted the revolution. Because USSR was training our, our military officers, so they had a lot of influence in the army. So they easily did a coup d'etat. And imagine that it was first time in my life that I heard the noise of a jet bomber. I mean, we, we never saw it. I never saw the tanks also in the country. The reason I'm saying that it was a poor country, but it was peaceful. We never saw these tanks and, and jet plane or helicopter to fly. So so low to on, on top of our head. So I, I had a young, young, very young sister who was uh, five year old and they were already in our house. So next morning my mother said that she didn't sleep the whole night, my younger sister. And my husband replied, he said, she didn't sleep also. 
Because I was really afraid the whole night. I was sweating and I was awake and I, of course I didn't allow my husband to sleep because I was afraid from the noise. And now we are so used to this noise. Every minute, every time of the day or night, it's flying away, but we, we know that it's flying and going to bomb somewhere, but we are so, so used. And it is, when we had the, um, of course, the coup d'etat, and they, they began really to, to arrest the people arbitrarily, to, to restrict every basic rights of the people, including right to freedom of expression and so on. People were not able to speak against the, the government and their activity. People were not really allowed to listen to BBC news. Because we, we had one channel of television, uh, which was just began a few, few years ago, but then it was fully controlled by the government. It, was, it is still a national television. It's owned by government. Um, so we gone through a lot of difficulties. They, they killed people, they arrested people. I mean, I remember that uh, we were sitting in the classroom and the person was coming behind the door and saying that who and who and who named some of our classmates and said that uh, they, they should come to the office. And we never saw them again. I was reading a, a bio, biography of a person who was in prison during that time and he'd gone through all these torture, I mean, tortures that you cannot imagine. Um, he wrote, he's in Holland. He wrote uh, his, his uh, stories in the, and I, I saw some name of my classmate, that he also saw him in the prison and then they were killed. I mean, it, it is so painful. Then of course the people began to, to resist. And again, when we fall at the end of, uh, of the, um, unfortunately, the wrong policy of uh, building green zone around Afghanistan to stop Russian advancement in the area. And it was Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter uh, presidency on that time. So that's why we had the um, Islamic revolution in, in Iran and we had the Islamization of Ziaulaq in Pakistan. So what was happened then, they began to train some of these Afghan who were refugees. Um, they picked the most conservative, uneducated people and trained them, give them weapon, give them money, give them, train them uh, in military activities to fight against USSR, to fight against communism. In the, in the meantime, that then women were completely lost because we were not important. It was men who carrying gun and useful for both sides. So women were ignored, no program for education, no program for health, no, no program or humanitarian program for women. It's still the, the humanitarian program is very, very men oriented. But uh, at least there are some issues in the UN and so on that you can, you can uh, discuss the gender sensitivity or gender, uh, genderizing of the policies. Uh, <clears throat> so we, I was involved on demonstration against the government and distributing some night letters against the acti their activity and the controlling the people, imposing uh, and violating of, uh, of human rights of the people. Anyway, but then I graduated. I, it was very, very difficult because I was spending all of my uh, Fridays just to go behind the, the, uh, the biggest jail that we have in Kabul to find out about my husband. It was not only my husband, but his three brothers, so four brothers from one family. We never heard from any one of them. Only two years ago when the, um, chief the public prosecutor of Holland uh, was investigating a Afghan who got asylum in Holland, not, I mean the family got asylum but he uh, got the residence permit, not asylum. Following him and he revealed a list of 5,000 people who were killed during his uh, role in the uh, intelligence service. And we, uh, still, I mean, the, 
out of four brothers, two of the brother name is in the list, but the two is not in the list. Anyway, uh, so it is. Then I graduated from uh, university as a as a doctor. Of course, I was uh, I was doing some um, some embroidery or uh, some tailoring in order to be able to continue my education because I mean the the one who was supporting me is gone, and it was so sad because he got some some uh, loan from the um, from the teachers. Um, Union or something, and he told me that why don't you take this money and put it in the bank because you should learn how to deal with the bank, how to write a check. And I said I um, I don't want because I I mean I I have class so I I can't do it and I'm not interested to learn how to write the check. But then even that money is is in the in the in the bank. I never had access to it. So it was really difficult, but what I did actually, I resist um, against all these and try to to be helpful as much as I can. So after graduation, we the the policy was such that anybody who was graduating from the university, they had to work for the government. So the government was giving job. So it was not like today that we have thousands of people graduating from university and they don't have job. So we had to, to work for the governmental service, for the public service, in order to be able to get the permission to open a private clinic. I mean, it was uh, a rule that, uh, this is not the case unfortunately today because um, some of the students who are already in fourth grade or fifth grade of medicine, they can open the <laughs> clinic and, and loot the people. Um, <clears throat> then I worked for uh, for four months in this hospital, one of the hospital, and then I left to because I was not safe actually. So I, I took my son, and I had already a son. My son was raised by my mother actually, and uh, I went to the uh, district where I come from. So it was very very difficult because I was very much on the city, and I didn't know the culture again of our own people. But I, I worked there for almost less than three years and it was very difficult because I, I had to send my son back to Kabul to, to be able to go to school because there was no school here. There was a school and the school was bombed by the, uh, by the government and also by the Mujahideen because Mujahideen was saying that the one who studies physics, the one who studies biology and chemistry, then they are not Muslim anymore. So because the educated one was leftist. I mean, they had a reason for it. Um, after three years, um, it was only MSF, uh, uh, a few doctors, but they were moving from one valley to another valley because when the government knew that there is MSF people, I mean, they were calling them uh, spies, so they were bombing. So I went to the MSF and I said, can, we, can you give me some something to, to continue? <laughs> then we... I was the only one speaking English, so every Friday they were coming to our house for a cup of tea and we were gossiping actually. And talking about our patients and about the difficulty that we face, nothing. I mean, no x-ray, no, no any, any other, other uh, possibility to, to support the, the, the diagnosis of the patients. I was traveling for three or four hours. I was, I was one case I... Um, I think I walked for maybe 10 hours or so. I arrived and the lady died. So before I arrived, she was in labor for, for so many, I think three days or so. So it was quite difficult. Then I decided to go um, to Pakistan because uh, I got open cough. I don't know if you people know open cough. Open cough <laughs> is not existing anymore. I mean, they are sporadic cases, but uh, I was thinking that maybe I got uh, uh, tuberculosis because it was a lot of tuberculosis cases around. So because nobody was there. Again, I went to the same as people. I said, can you, can you check if I have tuberculosis? Well, they said, Seema, it's better if you can go to Pakistan. So I went to Pakistan and then I had to stay in Pakistan. I went to, to uh, a person who was running 
supporting a branch of a hospital for Afghan refugees. It was Christian hospital, they call it Christian hospital, and it was built by British 100 years ago. In 85, it was the 100th anniversary of that hospital, so now it's 125 years old, 30 years old. So I got a job there, and I, I went to this man, and he said, do you have a certificate? And I said, no, because they didn't give us a certificate. And he said, how could I believe that you're a doctor? Well, I said that I'm willing to go through an exam. And I said that, yes, I, I have a certificate, but I bought it from a hotel in Peshawar because they were giving this false <laughs> um, certificate to everyone. And he said, he looked at me, he said, so how can I believe you? And I said, well, because I am telling you the truth. So he took me to the, the head of the, uh, the director of the hospital. He was a surgeon. He was a, a, a good eye specialist. Uh, he died a few years ago. He said, uh, this, this young girl, young woman, he, she claimed that she is a doctor, but she doesn't have a certificate. And she said that she bought the certificate from Peshawar in three, 300 rupees. And he, he laughed, actually. He said, you bought it? And I said, yes, because they didn't give us. And then he said, well, I, I mean, they were surprised because I was so bold and honest. And he, then he said, well, you look very honest, so can I ask you some question? And I said, yes. So he asked me some question. He said, which kind of disease do you have in the, in the area? Which, is, which disease is common? And I said, tuberculosis. And he said, how do you treat? And I said, this way. And then he said, okay. But then I said, uh, I'm here to, to learn surgery, and I want to go back to Afghanistan. So if you give me the job, I want you to teach me surgery. It was, sorry, my nose is not supported. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> then he said, you can come from tomorrow. So I, I was working very hard because it was my own people. And then twice a, day, twice a week I was going to, uh, to a clinic for the refugee camps. And it was, again, that clinic in the refugee camp was run by this NGO, which was uh, inter-church aid. All the church was funding them. Um, so there was a small tent, and then they built a, a half a meter wall because the dust was coming to the so-called clinic. And then beside us, it was a big structure. Began in the same time that we were establishing the clinic, uh, with a big wall, and it was madrasa. It was the religious school established for Afghan refugees by Saudi. And I, I mean, I was so naive on that time. I didn't know that they will become our government in the future and they will harass us. And I said, poor children, why they are such a big door and such a big Chinese lock? And I said, they are young children, five, six year old, why is such a big lock? Now that I realized that that was to terrorize and put them under pressure that nobody can break this big lock. And I was telling to this man, and I said, shame on you, look, your clinic, and look at the Arabs, how they are fast. I mean, I didn't know that it was not only Arab money, it was the money of the others. The, um, <clears throat> so that way, they really focused on their religious school, and they took most of the young Afghan children from the camps to those religious schools. And they become, later on, the current Taliban, unfortunately, and nobody was paying any attention to, to formal education, particularly, or to provision of health services, proper health services. So, and then I was, uh, I, because I was working in that hospital, these clinics for the Afghan refugees were not allowed to provide contraception. So I was taking some IUDs from the hospital in my bag, and when I was going to the camp, and I was trying to convince the woman that you have already 10 children, so it's enough, let's do something. And he went, no, my husband. And I said, will I put IUD? Your husband will not recognize. So I was doing all these th things, hiding from the, the, the men to give them some possibility to live. Um, then I, um, one day I went to the hospital and it was a young Afghan refugee woman who came with, a, um, she was pregnant for first child. 
and she came with convulsion because she had eclampsia. And I ran here and there to, to find something to control her convulsion. And I couldn't find the pharmacy key and I couldn't find the delivery room key. So I was really shocked and I went to the, this man. I mean, later on, after two hours, they, the news came that she died. So I was crying. I went to this British uh, uh, old man who was the head of this NGO. And I was crying. He said, what's happened, my daughter? Because I was always fighting. So, And I said, well, um, can you find? I, I went to open a hospital for women and children. No, my daughter. The uh, fundamentalist group, the Hizb Islami and so on, they will uh, bomb our office. And I said, I will not tell anyone if you give me the money. So I tried to convince him. And then he said, let me think and we will see tomorrow. Then I... Next day when I went, he said, okay, I will find you. But you should not really uh, do an, any advertisement that from where you get the money. So that was the way I started the hospital. And then slowly I, I began some schools. And then with this hospital, the foreign minister of Norway came to, the, because they were funding part of the, the program of this NGO, they came to see the hospital. So now the, this hospital became a success story. We began the female nurse training because for Afghans because we didn't have enough female nurses. And Pakistani nurses were working for the program for Afghans. And at the end of the day, we are so close on some of our culture, but still they were not understanding the language. They were not understanding the culture of the Afghans. So I began that hospital. And then when the foreign minister of Norway came in, he said, well, am I, I'm so impressed by the, the work you're doing. What can I do for you? And I said, can you find a hospital in Afghanistan? Because I saw that women were dying because of retention of placenta, which is, I mean, I think nobody will die in this country because of retention of placenta or missed abortion. And he said, yes, why don't you write a proposal and give me the proposal tomorrow? We can see tomorrow at 10 o'clock in hotel. And for me, I heard first time proposal. I mean, I said, what is proposal? Okay. I called a friend and I said, can you draw a hospital map or something, a structure? And then he drew and then the next morning I went to, we calculated roughly 2,400,000 Pakistani rupees. Well, it's a big hospital actually. I went to him and he said, yes, it's not a lot. It's, it was about maybe $200 on that time. $200,000. So he gave the, the money for the hospital and we began the construction of the hospital in 1988. And then of course we faced a lot of problem because they looted the hospital, they took the construction material, they took the electricity material, they took the ambulance, they beat it up my, my brother and, and it was difficult but I didn't get, give up. This hospital was looted three times. And then next year, the same, they invited me to Norway and it's 1989, March, first time I came to Norway and Sweden and Holland to see the donors. Uh, the, the person who was eco from Holland, who was my host, he was right, he was taking me by train to EU in Brussels. In the train, I saw a group of men who had a, a pink earring. And he said, Sima, do you know who they are? And I said, no, how do I know? And he said, they are homosexual. And what do you think about it? So we began to discuss. He said, I am so surprised that we are talking, I'm talking with an Afghan woman about homosexuality. And I said, well, it's their choice. They don't do any harm to others. I mean, it's, when they choose, it's, it's fine. And we, I mean, I don't forget that that after 15 minutes discussion, he said, I will write in my diary that uh, I discuss homosexuality with a woman in Afghanistan, from Afghanistan. And I said, no, they are, keep saying that we should respect the religion and culture of Afghanistan, so we should not talk about these issues. Wherever they are human beings, they are, unfortunately or fortunately, it does exist. It's also in Afghanistan, but we are hiding it. And it's not officially allowed, but it's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, misuse of young boys in Afghanistan. 
Um, anyway, so I was able then, uh, when I was in Norway, the, um, the foreign minister, I brought the photograph of the, it was, we didn't have a lot of uh, possibility. Of course, the digital was not, was not existing anymore. So I brought some black and white photograph for him and I said, this is the hospital. He said, what can I do for you, Seema, again? More than the hospital. And I said, why don't you fund some school? And then he said, how much? And I said, maybe 1,000 per school. So he promised $1,000 for a year for a school. So he promised $10,000. So I went back to Afghanistan in, um, in the same district where I come from. I began school. It was under the tree in the mosque, and, and, but for the boys. So I went in, Afghan, in, in, in our district. And then the mullah said, well, I think all these schools make the people leftist. They mentioned some of the pro-Russian uh, Hazara, who was prime minister, Krishnan is already in, in England, and some other. Um, uh, so I think this, this, uh, we need more mullahs and ulamas. Uh, so I I thought that I should really break the seriousness of the discussion. I said, well, Iran is only uh, Iran's production, import and export mullah and halwa. They have, they produce a very nice sweet uh, uh, in Iran. I think some people do know the halwa uh, from Iran. And they were laughing, but no, we need. And I said, well, you can have, I, I only open the schools in Chen village and the rest of the village is, is yours. So I began that way. And next year, I saw that the people, it was in every village when it was mosque, there was madrasa. As soon as I began the school, the, the students didn't go to the madrasas anymore. So next year, I went again and I said, well, if you don't allow your daughters, then I'm not going to find only the boys. So that way, we brought the, the girls in the school. And luckily, I, I think this, uh, district, everybody go to school. Every child go to school. And this district has the most uh, educated and graduate from, from university. And I think we have the most refugees also. Because when they study, when they graduate from university, then they think that maybe there's no future for them. And they have more ambition, that's why they come. I had an interview with the Swedish radio, and he was, she was asking that most, most of them are Hazaras, what's, what's the reason in from this district? And I said, well, you can blame me for this because I began the school. And this is the, uh, I mean, my intention was to train them and educate them for Afghanistan, not to send them to outside, but unfortunately the situation is such that they, they have to leave Afghanistan. So that's that way I began in it. We, then I was fighting for women's rights and women's participation, and I keep telling this story that even UN was not willing to support women's program. And they began after the, uh, the Russian withdrawal in 1989, they began to coordinate the, uh, the humanitarian program for Afghanistan. And the sad part is that when I was going and asking the UN agencies and some other NGOs to support him, um, health and education, they were saying health and education is not an emerg emergency program. It is development program, so we are sorry, we can't really support you. And the, the, we are still in emergency, unfortunately. After 20 years, we are still in emergency. And they're still not focusing enough on provision of basic social services to the people. Then we had the Mujahideen government. Unfortunately, Mujahideen government went in without any woman because when they were discussing the women, somebody mentioned that should we have a department for women's affairs? And one of the commander, he stand up on the table and shoot with his pistol. He said, are you Muslim? Who you are talking about women? This is not Islam. This is not Islam. We, we organized a big demonstration in, the, in Pakistan against the um, interim government which was established in Pakistan. Unfortunately, by Pakistani government. Uh, then we had, they fought and, and destroyed the country. 
every corner of the country was controlled by one of the political party. That's why the Taliban became in power as, a, as another stakeholder. So in 1994, Pakistani, uh, Pakistan government was sending a lot of their goods. So they, the USSR collapsed. And then most of the international community, NGOs, left Afghanistan, including the um, Australian aid program. I mean, they, they withdraw their support because the goal is achieved, which was the collapse of, of communism. And then the Pakistanis were sending their goods to, through Kandahar to Turkmenistan, and it was stopped by the Mujahideen group. The Mujahideen group was supported by Pakistan, but sometimes you train someone and they turn to be your own enemy. And then they sent a group of Taliban, and Taliban took, uh, released the goods, the Pakistani goods, which went to Turkmenistan, and then they began. And it was Benazir time when they supported the Taliban. I mean, I remember when Benazir, I mean, of course, her loss is, is a um, great loss for the region, uh, for women. Uh, she was getting a honorary degree from Philippines. And on her speech, she was saying, as a woman, how can I support the Taliban who lock out women behind 10 doors? But they were supporting the Taliban. So anyway, Taliban promised the people of Afghanistan that we will bring peace, we will disarm the people, and we will uh, bring rule of law. But as soon as they got, took the power, they locked down everything. Um, it was so difficult. I was uh, traveling for USIS program with a Taliban, um, one of the Taliban, uh, to US. It, this is 1998. So we both chosen to go for this USIS program. is a program of the American government, I think. They take people for three weeks. They show how they made their constitution. Actually, they show the governance. So it's me and a Talib. We are in the same flight. We saw each other in the airport in Karachi. So as soon as we board in the plane, and I took off my scarf, and because the plane was empty, and I lie down, and he said, ah, you already began. And I said, yes, do you have a problem? And he didn't have answers, so I slipped. We arrived in, in, in Washington. We were quite... Um, Hung, uh, hungry and uh, thirsty, so I said, "Can we, let's go and have some tea or something. Uh, we went and he said, well, I'm not eating because it's not halal. And I said, the cookies, I mean, it's not meat in it, so what do you think about halal or haram? So anyway, we bought some cookies and we ate there. And then he was, um, we went, they took us to a clinic which was run by uh, by Spanish people for Spanish illegal immigrant. And she was a medical doctor. She was telling me that, Sima, we have a lot of problem when a girl gets pregnant before they get married, we kick out from the house. They are pushed out of the house. And I said, well, you pushed out of the house, we kill. And she stand up, she said, you're killing? And I said, yes. He said, why? And I said, Taliban does it every day. And then this Talib, when we get out, then we would know. I said, well, it's true. So we walked out and he said, when we go back, then I will know what to do with you. You're talking against Islam principle. And I said, it's not against Islam principle. Who has given you the right to kill someone? And anyway, we, then later on, we become very friends friendly towards the end of then I said let's uh, let's not do these things because I had a relative and I was bringing food from our relative house saying that it is halal so eat because you will die so we were going to the um, Georgetown University on the way on the uh, in the metro so there was it was summer so it was a young quite healthy fat, I would say, I don't know, uh, a girl sitting in front of us in the metro with the shorts. And he was looking like, okay, and then we arrived in the, in the cafeteria, said, let's go and have Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he said, it's not halal. 
And I said, it's much halal than the, I saw that you were looking at the leg of that woman. <laughs> it's very halal than that, what you did. No, 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 I was not looking. And I said, I saw you. And next time I'll take your photo. Then we really became, we, we bought the Kentucky Fried Chicken he ate. It's so delicious. And I see, I said, see, it's much halal than the, <laughs> what you saw. Um, so that was our, our life at the end. I mean, this same men, they had their, um, the Taliban had their representative in, in uh, New York, Hakim Mujahid, currently he's in Kabul. In our last day of the meeting, he called this Talib and said that you have to see me in, in New York because you're traveling with women and you're traveling with Hazara. And this woman is so loud. I mean, I was talking the truth, actually. And then he came and said, hey, my sister, what should I do? And I said, don't get out of the airport. He will not find you. Because the Kennedy Airport is quite big, so you don't, if you see him somewhere, then go to the toilet. <laughs> then I asked him to, because he was coming quicker to, to Quetta. And I said, can you take some of my book? Because I got some medical book and I wanted that to be. And I said, you don't have a lot of your luggage, so can you take the book and I give you my husband's uh, telephone number. So I called home and I said, this man is coming with my book. So pick him up from the airport and take him for home and give him lunch. He went and he went to our house and then he had lunch and then he asked for a pray mat. And my husband gave in and he said, ah, you people are Muslim and everybody is saying that you are not Muslim. The reason I'm telling this story, how much they brainwashed. How much they convinced. This is the one who went with, uh, with me to, to America. So imagine, if he's that conservative and, and, and narrow-minded, then the one who never see. I mean, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of jokes that the people now are making. Because they, they, it's a joke that these young boys are making these days. That a suicide attacker, a young boy who was injured and then he was in the hospital. He opened his eyes, he was unconscious. When he opened his eye, he saw a, a young female nurse. And then he said, where is the other 29? Because they promised us 30 of you in the haven. And, and this is the reality. And I stop here, I think, because you people will be bored. And then I'll continue with some of the question and answer. And thank you very much for your attention.